What's going on guys? The NFL draft has come and gone and now we enter the most depressing time of the NFL year where there's just absolutely nothing to talk about. But after three days of the NFL draft, Avengers Endgame being released, and the craziest episode of Game of Thrones, we could probably use a little bit of downtime to just sit back and admire what our teams have done or not done to make themselves better for the 2019 NFL season. Now compared to Game of Thrones and Avengers, the NFL draft was relatively boring so shout Shout out to Dave Gettleman and the Giants for giving us a few laughs here and there. Some of you are probably thinking that yeah, post draft grades are dumb, but they're fun and that's probably why you clicked on this video because deep down it is fun to kind of grade these draft classes way too early. Remember the 2017 draft when the 49ers finessed the Bears and got them to switch spots with them and then they went ahead and drafted the top edge rusher and then traded back into the end of the first round to get Reuben Foster. Everybody anointed John Lynch as this GM prodigy and now that draft class is a George Kittle away from being one of the most catastrophic drafts ever but there are so many variables that can happen in the years following to impact the overall value received in a draft so even if everybody's saying that your team had an awful draft wait a couple years and things could turn around for this video i went in the order the teams made their first pick because that was just the easiest way to make a list so don't look into that too much i probably don't even have to ask because i'm sure you all let me have it in the comments but i really want to hear the picks that you really like the most from your team the later the pick the better i'm not going to pretend like i'm dane brugler and i can give you a scouting report on every single player so please inform me of a late round draft guy that you think can make an early impact on your team i'd love to check them out and if you're starving for nfl talk this offseason go ahead and join my discord channel it's in the description below it's gonna be a great place for the upcoming dead time in the nfl we've got some true diehards in there that love to jump into a football debate any time of day but let's unpack this 2019 nfl draft first up we've got the cardinals and back in my day the team with the first overall pick didn't bs us all offseason about who they were taking and then run the clock all the way down anyways i'm not a fan out of the cardinals handled this process with Kyler Murray and Josh Rosen. I'm assuming that they were trying to keep the pick on the table for someone to come and blow them away with a trade down, but as far as the general public knows, that never presented itself. The Cardinals have to be banking on Cliff Kingsbury's scheme to get the ball out quickly because Cardinals waited way too long to address their biggest need in my opinion, and that's the offensive line. But you can't blame the Cardinals for not reaching an offensive line when there were just so many great players falling into their lap. I mean, Byron Murphy was the top cornerback on some people's boards. Andy Isabella is an interesting pick in the second round. That might have been a little bit of a reach, but then to add Hakeem Butler there, they have completely transformed their wide receiving core. And Keyshawn Johnson in the sixth round makes a lot of sense too for them. Now they finally have got some guys that will fit this system and allow Kyler Murray to have some guys to work with once Larry Fitzgerald retires. Zach Allen, another one of my favorite players in this draft. I can't believe that he lasted all the way into the third round. And Deontay Thompson was a steal too. I think he's got a great potential to develop. He had a rough second half of the season last year that made him fall really far down the boards and he let a wrist injury prevent him from performing. Uh, a bunch of drills this offseason so that hurt his stock and then to finish the draft with Mr. Irrelevant being Caleb Wilson I mean I was ready to give Caleb Wilson in the second round of drafts at the beginning of the offseason so that's a great pick and even with the mishandling of Josh Rosen the Cardinals get an A from me in this draft the 49ers didn't let some questionable social media activity deter them from taking the best player available in Nick Bosa and their interest in Debo Samuel was probably one of the worst kept pre-draft secrets so the first two picks were no real surprise for me Jalen Hurd though he was a surprising pick because he seemed like everybody late round darling and seven round mock drafts but the 49ers were smart for grabbing him earlier than later if they really wanted him even after drafting Debo Samuel the pick before remember Jalen Hurd is the guy that kept Alvin Kamara on the bench at Tennessee so I'm interested to see how Kyle Shanahan uses this chess piece in his offense it was amusing when the 49ers took the first specialist off the board but Mitch Wisnowski not only has a cool last name but has been a beastly punter and it's a position that it's nice when you have a weapon there overall the 49ers ignored needs along the offensive line but I mentioned in my seven round mock that it wasn't that big of a deal all they need is the guys on their offensive line to stay healthy and grabbing a late round offensive tackle prospect who can potentially play interior offensive line too makes sense and you guys know I'm a big UVA guy I scout them a lot here locally and Tim Harris might end up being a steal even though corner was not their biggest need I would have liked to have seen a safety in there somewhere too but overall I think that this draft was a B plus the passing of Josh Allen for Quinnen Williams is one that I didn't expect but it does make sense Q is the better NFL prospect and gives the Jets someone to take over for Leonard Williams next year when his fifth year option expires and say what you want about Ja'Kai Polite and the way that he handled the pre-draft process he was viewed still as one of the top edge rushers coming out for the season and then Mike McCagnan resisted trading up into the second round and it, it paid off I also love the pickup of the versatile offensive lineman Chuma Adoga who was actually Sam Darnold's college teammate I really wanted to include him as one of the offensive linemen in my seven round mock draft video for the Jets but I was too much of a coward because of the teammate I expect I didn't want to get too cute with it but I should have because it made a ton of sense then and it makes a ton of sense now 
considering this offensive line is still in pretty rough shape. Blake Cashman was supposed to be one of the fast risers in this draft, but I think one thing these NFL GMs remind us of every year is not to read too much into the combine result and whatnot because their boards are pretty much set before the combine even happens. But somehow we all, including myself, still do it every year. Either way, I think that Cashman was decent value and makes sense around the fifth, sixth round anyways, and he could develop into a future starter. He's never going to wow you, but he should be a very reliable player at linebacker. And then I can't tell you much about Bless You on Austin, but I found his first name quite amusing, especially after the video of... Quinn and Williams sneezing, blessing himself, and then thanking himself also after that video went viral. I thought that was hilarious and ironic. To the different uh, character things. Uh, listen, thank you that I got here, so. Didn't help their draft grade though. I, I give it a B overall. They didn't really wow me with any picks, but everything seems pretty solid and on board. So this draft could actually end up being a lot better in the long run, especially if Ja'Kai Polite pans out. If you compare the Raiders draft to Amari Cooper and Khalil Mack, then there's no way the Raiders are ever gonna win. So I'm not gonna do that here. I'm taking it easy on them because I'm not taking it easy on the other teams that traded their first round picks. There were reports that the Raiders wanted to trade up from number four overall and that was probably only if the Cardinals really didn't take Kyler Murray. There was also rumors that a surprise pick was going to happen number four and it sure was. The Raiders selection of Cleveland Furl was fun to nitpick for a few picks until the Giants distracted us with possibly the worst pick of the entire draft but I'm not actually going to hate on this pick. Furl was the clear-cut best player on a defensive line with three first round picks. The lack of physical testing shouldn't have knocked him down boards, but sometimes I think we get bored with prospects when they are known commodities coming into their final season before draft eligible, and we want the hot newness like Montez Sweat or Brian Burns. Leadership was mentioned in the emotional phone call with Mike Mayock. Leadership, all right, man, that's why you're, that's why you're coming here. I'm not going to all right. Yes, sir. I promise. You. I promise. You. All right, man. We're excited. And I think that's the immeasurable and tangible that made him the Raiders guy. So pump the brakes on judging this as a bad pick early on. And I wasn't a fan of drafting Josh Jacobs at 24, but they must have had intel that the Colts could snatch him up before their next pick. But if you're going to draft a running back in the first round, at least make it into the late first. So I'm okay with this too. Jonathan Abram wasn't my favorite safety in this class, and I don't like what this spells for Carl Joseph, but maybe they see Abram playing more of a hybrid linebacker role in nickel and dime packages. Otherwise, if they move on from Carl Joseph, that's just another wasted pick on a safety from the last regime when really I thought that he started to play pretty well at the end of the year. The rest of this draft was one awesome pick after another awesome pick. All of them with just great value. Mullen, Crosberry, Johnson, Moreau, all of these guys were players that I would welcome onto my team. And Hunter Renfro, he brings great leadership too, and I think that that's what Mike Mayock and John Gruden were really trying to do with this team. But somebody let Mike Mayock know that he can scout more than just the national championship game. Overall, I give this draft an A minus. The Buccaneers also made it pretty clear that Devin White was their guy and they did not waver, even with Josh Allen on the board. Then they turned their attention to addressing one of the worst pass defenses in the league with three straight defensive backs. Sean Bunting was a fast riser in the pre-draft process, but he's going to be compared to Greedy Williams his entire career after the Bucs passed on him. And then I really liked Anthony Nelson as a defensive end in the fourth round, but he's not really a pure pass rush guy and I'm worried about where the pass rush is going to come from in this defense, especially with their shift to more of a hybrid scheme with more 3-4 looks under Todd Bowles. Jason Pierre-Paul got shipped out of New York because he didn't fit that scheme, so they're going to try and force him into the scheme now with that. I don't know. I would have liked to have seen some sort of an edge rusher who was more of a pure pass rusher guy. And then we didn't make fun of the Buccaneers for drafting a kicker in the second round, so then they had to go and they had to draft one of the first kickers in the fifth round. Really, guys? Are you trolling us now? I was surprised to see the Buccaneers use a pick on a wide receiver, and then they went and signed a whole bunch of wide receivers in the undrafted free agent pool, so we're going to see if there's going to be some turnover or maybe somebody being shipped out there. But overall, with the lack of a pass rusher in this draft class, I can only give this team a top grade of a B minus, but I love Devin White. He was one of my favorite players. One of the safest picks in the draft, I think. And if they hit on him and Sean Bunting, this is going to be a solid class either way. Oh, Giants. Oh, man. I said it before, and I will gladly eat my words in three years when Daniel Jones finally gets to start if he's really good. But this was the worst pick of the draft. I said it in my live stream, too. It reminds me of the time when the Jaguars reached on Blake Bortles at number three overall. All the talk was about Teddy Bridgewater and Johnny Manziel, and Bortles was this emerging prospect with all the physical tools that you would look for in an NFL quarterback. But not only did the Giants, on top of that draft, a nose tackle with the Odell Beckham pick, Edelman opened his mouth and dug the Daniel Jones pick even further into the dirt. He walked out there and I saw a professional quarterback. After, his, after the three series that I watched, I saw a professional quarterback. So that's why 
I was in full bloom. Love. DeAndre Baker is probably the only move I really agreed with in the top of their draft, but even that's questionable after spending your third on Western Michigan cornerback Sam Beal in the supplemental draft last year. It felt like the Giants were just trying to save face on the first day of the draft and just get somebody that the public agreed with. And then now you can actually see the return on Odell Beckham Jr., which I think the Giants fans are coming around now and losing a little bit of faith in Dave Gettleman as their GM and realizes that that probably wasn't the best move. The grade that I'm giving the Giants is actually the first letter of the first three first round picks that they had so sorry guys that's the worst grade in the draft for me the Jags were an easy team to pick for in mock drafts because for a while it seemed like Jawan Taylor was just destined to be the pick at number seven overall but Josh Allen falling into their laps did change things a little bit and then the fact that they were able to land Jawan Taylor in the second round makes this feel like they came away with two first round picks in the third round with Josh Oliver and Quincy Williams, they might have reached a little bit there, but if those are guys that they actually sought out, then more power to them. Running back, quarterback, and defensive tackle depth was definitely needed, so I think that those were all pretty solid picks. It's hard to lose, though, when you get two first-round values in the first two rounds. I'm giving this draft an A. The Lions surprised me with taking TJ Hawkinson so early in the draft. They should have traded down because history has shown us that taking a tight end in the top 10 is just a bad move more often than not. The Lions should also know about taking tight ends in the first round. It hasn't worked out for them yet. It's time to stop making the same mistake, guys. Even if this pick pans out and TJ Hawkinson ends up being a good player, there's going to be so many more defensive players that were taken after this that would have prevented them from having to reach on the next few draft picks. The Falcons probably would have given them some kind of a package here also to jump in front of the Bills for Oliver and then they could have had another shot at Hawkinson at 14 or even settle for Brian Burns and collected more picks in this deep class but Matt Patricia seems to think he needs a baby Gronk in his efforts to replicate the Patriots so this is the kind of stuff you're going to get. Amani Oruare really made up for the three defensive reaches in the second to fourth rounds but we'll see how they translate into Patricia's defense. I do think they got a steal in tight end Isaac Nata but once again that's overkill when you've already drafted a tight end number eight overall. I didn't really like this draft that much I'm not super impressed so I'm going to give them a C plus. The Bills had a guy that I believe was also a victim to the over analysis from going into a season as a top three prospect. There's nowhere really to go but down in the evaluation process from there. Ed Oliver could be such a steal at number nine. And then Cody Ford gives great value. They probably considered him at number nine overall before Ed Oliver actually fell into their lap like that. And then they got their two biggest needs locked up in the top two rounds with two players that could be considered steals. I love the offensive weapons that they added too. Dawson Knox has got a really high ceiling as a tight end and it was not tapped into at all in college so that could also be a seal for them and Devin Singletary actually compares a lot to LaShawn McCoy so that'll be a pretty seamless transition when they finally move on from Shady which I would have done as soon as he spoiled Avengers Endgame. Tyree Jackson staying as a local undrafted free agent is a pretty underrated move. I'm not really going to include a lot of undrafted free agent moves in this because I think that that's unfair. A lot of these guys won't even end up making the roster but as a local guy him staying local and with a similar skill set really to Josh Allen I love the the fit there as him developing into a potential backup quarterback overall i give this a b plus the Steelers were really aggressive and jumped up in front of the division rival Bengals to grab the linebacker that they had been rumored to have a lot of interest in. They did give up a lot for it though, but I do like the aggressiveness. That's not typically the Steelers' MO in drafts. And as much as I want to hate on Deontay Johnson because I didn't really know much about him going into this, so seeing him as one of the top wide receivers off the board was a little bit questionable to me. But if there's one thing that we've learned from the past, I don't know, decade or so is you don't question the Steelers when they're drafting wide receivers. These guys, they just know what they're doing. And then I loved Justin Lane. I can't believe he fell to their lap like that in the third round I think that he's gonna end up being a steal for them and then Benny Snell signals a return to just more of a focus on the power running game and then what he did with the Le'Veon Bell jersey was just savage I love it great way to start your career off I think that that's a great way to get into um the hearts of the Steel Curtain fans but I wasn't really blown away by the rest of their draft I think everything was relatively solid I'd give them a higher grade had they not spent so much on trading up but Devin Bush could make it irrelevant so we're gonna give them a B plus plus. The Bengals were probably okay with the Steelers using multiple resources to grab Devin Bush because Jonah Williams is another top five prospect that fell due to the hot newness going in the top 10. And he's going to help one of the worst offensive line units in the league and prevent Bobby Hart from being anything more than a backup swing tackle for them. The Bengals clearly identified their needs and double dipped at offensive line, linebacker, and running back in this draft. These guys will help replace Vontaze Burfecht and provide insurance for Joe Mixon and Giovanni Bernard. Gio might even be replaced by Trevion Williams sooner than later because 
they've got really similar skill set. And between Mixon, Geo, Travion, and then Rodney Anderson in the sixth, somebody's got to be healthy for this team each week moving forward. Ryan Finley was a solid developmental quarterback, but I wouldn't expect much from him. It's weird to me that he got drafted before either of the NC State wide receivers because I felt like they were the ones making him and not the other way around. They bailed him out with insane catches, and Kelvin Harmon just made amazing catches for him on the regular. So we'll see if he pans out. But like I said, don't expect too much. And then I really like the move of pairing up Michael Jordan to play alongside his old teammate and Billy Price. And it allows Michael Jordan to play guard, which is what he played in the NBA and won six championships with. So obviously playing guard for him makes a lot of sense. I'm going to give this grade a B minus though, because I felt like Jermaine Pratt and Drew Sample were a little bit of reaches. And I actually would have liked to have seen them get another wide receiver in there, especially if they're going to let John Ross go. The Packers may be the reason the Lions didn't trade down for TJ Hawkinson and the pack had to settle for the ultimate boom or bust pick in this draft. Rashawn Gary I thought was actually going to end up falling a little bit more once we found out that there was maybe some medical concerns going into the draft and then trading up for Darnell Savage was an interesting move that I just didn't see coming. They must have really coveted him and didn't think he'd make it past some of the safety needy teams in front of them. This is a move where I can't downgrade them because I don't necessarily agree with their draft board and we'll have to see it play out on the field but having the best name of the safety class isn't going to be enough for this move to be a good one. He needs to be the best player in this safety class altogether for that move to really work out. But I love the move of Elgin Jenkins and Jace Sternberger. I felt like those were great value picks in the second and third round and are going to be centerpieces on this offense moving forward. Overall, I gave him an A-. Christian Wilkins was a solid pick that I mentioned and mocked a few times leading up to the draft for the Dolphins. He showed the energy that he will bring to the Dolphins locker room on stage with Goodell, and that's exactly what Brian Flores needs to rebuild things in Miami. It's funny because I joked in my final mock about them tanking for Tua, and they were able to collect the 2020 draft pick in the process of trading down, and then they traded that second round pick after trading down to the Cardinals for Josh Rosen. Personally, I love Josh Rosen last year, and I think he's still got an awesome potential as an NFL quarterback. I don't even need to go over the rest of these guys in this draft class even though I really liked Michael Dieter and I thought that Miles Gaskin was a nice pick in the seventh round but this draft class is going to hinge on if the Dolphins allow Josh Rosen to be successful and if they build on him going into the future if they try to turn around and move up and get to a still then this was a silly pick I mentioned them drafting a guy in the late rounds in my mock draft just so that they could keep the fans happy for a year and try and make it look like they're not tanking but if they don't legitimately give Josh Rosen a success it's not only is shameful on them but it just looks bad for the league i think that this is a good quarterback and put a decent offensive line in front of him he could be really successful i hope that josh rosen ends up being the dolphins future quarterback and if they go ahead and win more games than we all really anticipate this year he's definitely a guy i'll be rooting for overall i'm going to give them an a because they were able to land a top 10 quarterback for a very late second round pick there's no better deal than that in the nfl the Falcons trading up for Ed Oliver was one of the more predictable scenarios that just seemed to make too much sense to not happen. And after spending so much draft cattle, capital to trade back into the first and reach on a questionable offensive tackle, I'm even more confused as to why they didn't trade up for Oliver. Don't get me wrong, Chris Lindstrom is a solid addition to an offensive line that has struggled to become one of the better units in the league, despite the extensive efforts made to protect Matt Ryan. But they just gave up way too much and then ended up with not a lot of capital to do a lot later on in the draft. And they came away with two offensive lines early on that might not change things very drastically for them moving forward. I'm going to give the Falcons a C, but there's definitely room for this draft class to improve. John Kaminsky could be a really good player over time, but he's going to need some time to develop. Whew. All right, here we go. This team is typically the offseason NFL champion, but not for their efforts in the draft. It's usually for their efforts in free agency, but the Redskins unanimously across the board, I think for everybody that's looking, came away with one of the best draft classes that you'll ever see. They had one of the top two or three quarterbacks just fall into their lap at number 15 overall, which is crazy good value because quarterbacks never fall that far into draft, even if they're below average first round prospects. Then the move to trade up and get Montez Sweat was such a shrewd one and then to add Terry McLaurin to Dwayne Haskins is not only a perfect fit for this offense to give him that familiarity with his college quarterback just makes so much sense I love it when teams draft college teammates I think it just gives them so much more of a leg up to transition into the locker room so much faster I felt the move to get Bryce Love was early but he gives you another running back coming off of a ACL tear that will probably allow them to have another dynamic weapon to anticipate coming off the bench as a running back and would be a great compliment to Darius Geis 
place. And you know the Redskins have to take a Alabama player. And center Ross Piercebacher has got a sweet name and offers some good value. They got some good interior offensive linemen there with him and Wes Martin. And then Kelvin Harmon, man. What a freaking steal. There had to be something other than NFL GMs thinking that this guy is just slow because he is a beast, man. I'm, I, I had him in the first round. I don't know why or what caused him to last until the sixth round, but there he is. And then actually Jimmy Moreland is a JMU prospect from right up the road here for me. And that means it's right up the road for the Redskins. Could be a great late round prospect to uh, develop for them at cornerback, which I thought was actually a bigger need. So I kind of like that they took a late round guy as a flyer and then wait for Josh Norman to completely fall off and then you replace him. I gave the Redskins an A+. Brian Burns was one of my favorite prospects in this draft class from early on in the process. His bend is an ideal trait for game-changing pass rushers, and I even had him mocked as high as number seven, I think, to the Jaguars, maybe even number five to the Buccaneers at one point. He's the Julius Peppers replacement, while also allowing the Panthers to shift towards more of a hybrid defense. And then adding Greg Little was a, is a risky pick, but it's one that could pay off a lot for them down the road. Drafting Will Greer was cool because, you know, I was glad to finally see him come off of the board, but it's a little bit concerning also. It means that ownership and management is a little bit more concerned with cam newton's shoulder than maybe we thought but at least you've got a nice local kid to inject some energy and youth in there and will greer actually could be an ideal lifetime backup quarterback in the nfl one of those uh ryan fitzpatricky types it's gonna inject a little bit of a spark immediately into an offense when called in so if he does have to come in for cam newton or even maybe start the year for cam newton while he rehabs that shoulder things wouldn't be completely off the rails and then christian Miller is another pass rusher they could have gotten two potential starting edge rushers in this draft if christian miller can get his body right that guy is going to be solid and then dennis daly was another pick i really liked here another local guy carolina dude and terry godwin i can't believe fell to the seventh round but overall some really good picks here i'm gonna give the panthers an a Garrett Bradbury was linked to the Vikings quite often leading up to the draft, and we kind of always knew it'd be an offensive lineman here, but a center wasn't the most obvious option after getting Ohio State center Pat Elfline in the third round a couple years ago. Bradbury probably allows the Vikings to hold a training camp competition for the starting center position, with the other guy getting shifted to play guard alongside, but it's likely this is Bradbury's job to lose. Irv Smith kind of signals the end of Kyle Rudolph's tenure in Minnesota, which is kind of sad because he's had a nice long career there. Hopefully they can just allow Irv Smith to slowly ease in and transition into their starter next year and give Kyle Rudolph another year there but we'll see Alex Madison was kind of a reach for me but I really liked Drew Samia and Cameron Smith I thought those were solid pickups and then I'm shocked that Chris Boyd lasted all the way to the seventh round but Mike Zimmer does a really good job of addressing needs a year early so that they're not glaring needs that sort of pigeonhole you into taking a guy in the first round which leads to a lot of good draft steals so there's definitely potential for a couple of those in this draft class but it's so hard to project those so as for now I'm going to give them a B. I wanted to make a splash move for the Titans in my final mock draft because they were hosting the draft and this player will likely always hold a special place in their hearts of fans because they drafted him in Nashville. I mean, that's the way I anticipated being with Leighton Van Der Esch and Cowboys fans last year. That was a great pick. And while Jeffrey Simmons still might be that guy one day, it felt like they basically punted on this upcoming season by grabbing a guy that can't help you until 2020. AJ Brown made up for it. I actually really liked that pick and I really liked Imani Hooker. We'll see about Nate Davis. They needed interior offensive line help and then DeAndre Walker was an awesome great steal and then David Long undersized guy could play an inside linebacker role in this 3-4 but I can't really give this draft more than a B minus because of the Jeffrey Simmons pick I really felt like I wanted to see this team going into this year with a little bit more win now mentality and to me like I said that just feels like hunting for uh, 2020 hopefully they're not ready to give up on Marcus Mariota and they're not secretly tanking for two also I've been hard on John Elway but I gotta admit he crushed it in this draft and then and he also ended the drought early on in this draft and finally gave the crowd a trade. That's what we were looking for, right? It was a bit of a leap of faith and it's possible that the guy that they wanted to fall 10 more picks to them again went somewhere in, in between in the teens because Noah Fant initially seemed like a really odd pairing with them. In my live stream, we'd actually just looked at the Broncos depth chart and felt like they were pretty set at the skill positions on offense. But Jake Butt was probably the biggest question mark and Fant's a dynamic player at the tight end position. So it could be a really good value pick for them down the road.
the road. And then I really loved the selection of Dalton Reisner. I know that everybody anticipated that was going to be Drew Locke, but the fact that they were able to use their third selection and still get the guy that we all mocked to them at 10 overall was a great, great value. And then Draymond Jones is just a really high potential steal in the third round. We'll see if they're able to shift him and turn him into a uh, five technique in this defense. Could be an ideal shift for him and um, hopefully they can get the most out of him. But overall, I still gave this draft an A. Man, Howie Roseman is one of the best in the league at doing what he does. And jumping in front of the Texans to get Andre Dillard was one of the best moves of the draft. Just shows how aware they are of the needs of not only their team, but other teams and how this process worked. If they just sat there, they would have had to select between some other offensive tackle they didn't feel a lot better about. But just by giving up one extra pick, they were able to jump in front of a guy where they knew he was probably going to end up going and landed their guy. And then Miles Sanders staying in Pennsylvania was pretty cool. But J.J. Arcega-Whiteside is going to be such a solid pickup for Carson Wentz. This reminds me a lot of the year that they went and won the Super Bowl and they loaded up on offensive talent for Carson, except this year, instead of doing it via free agency, they're doing it through the draft, which is probably a better idea. It's going to be a lot easier going on the salary cap and, you know, gives Carson Wentz some young players and not so much pressure. He can just grow up with these young guys. And then I was surprised that they didn't address the defensive tackle position, but then sending a seventh to the Colts for Hassan Ridgeway was a really good move. Overall, I'm giving the Eagles an A. They crushed it. All right, now we have the Texans. So quick story here. I don't believe in having a second favorite NFL team to root for, but with me being from Texas, I kind of hope for success for the Titans and the Texans from, you know, a little bit of a distance. And I've been on the Deshaun Watson train for long before he even got to Houston. So when I got those two paired up, I really was excited for their potential. But there are a few teams in the league that just really struggle to evaluate offensive line prospects. And the Texans are definitely one of them. They really did get screwed by the Eagles jumping in front of them. And this feels like last year when the Raiders traded back thinking Mike McGlinchey would still be on the board and then when he went they just sort of panicked and settled for Colton Miller. I kind of wish that they would have tried to trade down a little bit but with a couple of offensive line needy teams right behind them I get it why they didn't want to risk that. Titus Howard is a really interesting prospect and could end up being a legit NFL left tackle but coming from a small school as well as the second offensive tackle they took in as many picks in Max Sharping it's fair to assume that there might be a steeper learning curve for these two and with the Texans in win now mode these guys were definitely head scratchers. Kahale Waring I think the that's how you pronounce his name at tight end and Charles Omanihu I think he, that's how you pronounce his name I should know I'm a Texas fan um those guys are low-key future starters honestly and I actually kind of like the idea of adding a fullback to this offense you'd be surprised how a guy like Lamar Miller could probably perform with a little bit of an extra blocker in front of him I mentioned that they should go back to back along the offensive line at some point or at least two out of the first three picks and even though I'm not too familiar with the actual abilities of these prospects I say that they nailed this draft as far as addressing needs but I'm going to give them a B minus because some of the picks felt like a little bit of a reach. The Ravens trading down a couple spots to take the guy that they probably would have taken at 22 was a shrewd move that had shades of Ozzie Newsome in there. Now, I had been screaming for DK for the last hour or so at this point, so when the Ravens got back on the clock, I assumed that it was definitely DK. Now, while Marquise Brown might be more of a complete all-around wide receiver, I don't know if I'd take a 160-pound wide receiver in the first round, but Brown does offer some vertical explosion that's desperately missing from this offense. Miles Boykin was also a nice pickup in the third to contrast Brown, and Justin Hill is a nice contrast to the power running backs they already have there. So overall, I think that they surrounded Lamar Jackson with some good weapons. Now, people have soured on Jalen Ferguson quickly, but the Ravens are so good at reloading on defensive talent, and Ferguson could end up being in a really good place just to find success and then just develop at his own pace here. Ben Powers was a solid late round depth player along the offensive line and could develop into a starter for them one day, while Trace McSorley was a surprise because he's not really an NFL quarterback, but if there is an offense that he could be a backup quarterback in, it is this one. McSorley could also just add some Taysom Hillishness to the weaponry here on offense. The Ravens didn't blow me away here, but in the first draft without Ozzie Newsome, they could have fooled me that he ever left. I'm going to give them an A. Defensive tackle was one of the Chargers' biggest needs, and Tillery was a late first, early, second round projection guy. The knock on him was more personality-based than on his talent, so I like that they were able to take him when they wanted to. I think that that's a great place for him to succeed, playing alongside Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram. Nazir Adderley was an absolute steal, and another player that I had mocked to the Chargers in the first round at one point in the pre-draft process. So here's another team getting almost two first-round picks in their first two selections. Adderley and Derwin James are going to be a safety duo that can honestly 
rival Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor in their prime. Easton Sticks an interesting quarterback prospect for them. He was just a winner at the college level after taking over for Carson Wentz at North Dakota. He offers a little bit more of a dynamic running ability, so it'll be interesting to see how they fit him in and how they try to develop him as a prospect. Double dipping a linebacker was also important, and I really like the flyer they took on Cincinnati's defensive tackle, Cortez Broton. But time will tell if Trey Pimpkins is a legit option at offensive tackle. Like I said, these guys are hard to scout as an average Joe. You just have to trust the evaluation by the team. I'm going to give this draft an A-. minus. Why every single year does it seem like the Seahawks draft board is just completely backwards compared to the general public's? I mean, LJ Collier wasn't even close to a first round pick two months ago before the draft, but I guess neither was Rashad Penny. Then drafting the relatively unknown safety Marquise Blair after that had this class headed for an F grade. DK Metcalf was the biggest deal of the draft and saved this draft class from being a complete tragedy. I had the Seahawks as DK Metcalf's floor in this early process, but it seemed like he was going to be long gone by then. I'm assuming the health concerns are the biggest reason for his fall and maybe some of the stiffness too short but it's usually character concerns or health concerns that are typically to blame i don't think that he has any character concerns you could move dk into the first round here and then slide collier and blair just down around and this would have looked like a well-organized plan of attack but overall it just kind of felt sloppy and they were just jumping around not really knowing who they wanted or where they were actually going to get but that is kind of on brand for this front office but i gotta give this a c grade but dk metcalf's one of my favorite prospects this could easily end up an a if he turns out to be as good as I anticipated he would be. Those of you who've seen some of my pick'em videos from the regular season, you guys know that I enjoy hating on the Patriots as much as any guy, and I'll do it at any given chance. And in my final rumors mock, I mentioned how annoying it was that such a successful draft just seemed to fall into the Patriots' lap every single time I go through a simulation. But it's pretty funny, some people assumed that I was just setting it up like that on purpose for some odd reason. And that's because the Patriots have very few holes on their team, and can actually go best player available, and where they were slotted to pick, it just sort of allowed them to clean up solid talent from each round that fell to them. Take the first round for example. Nikhil Harry is going to be a vicious weapon in this offense, especially with Tom Brady becoming more and more of a checkdown specialist in his old age. I might have picked Justin Lane over Joe Juan Williams, but that's just splitting hairs here. I'm just nitpicking. Yadni Kajust is another player that I had in the first round earlier in the draft process in mock drafts. And doesn't Chase Winovich just seem like the kind of player the Patriots really white? Damian Harris was kind of surprising, but like I said, the Patriots can stay true to their board and take best player available. And with the nature of running back being a position with high injury risk it makes sense and was a luxury pick that they could afford here but jared sinem could prove to be the biggest deal of this entire draft class maybe even the entire draft if he becomes the heir apparent for tom brady he finds himself in a dream spot for future success that or the patriots will turn around and trade him for his second round pick in a couple years but i gotta give the patriots an a on this they killed it Chris Ballard is also crushing this whole draft thing. I mean, he turned the trade down with the Jets last year into a situation now where the Colts can trade down each season and always have plenty of ammunition for the upcoming draft. To me, that's just, it's nice to have that sort of safety blanket that you know you've got extra picks coming up in the draft. Rocky Sin was a great prospect to come away with after trading down. I really felt like the Colts got decent value for the positions of need in the first four rounds. Ben Minogu is more of a traits player and may have been a reach in the eyes of some, but athletes can get taken at any time in the draft and he he has a raw prospect to their pass rush with a skill set unique to the guys that they already have there. He could potentially develop into a true right end pass rusher for them. I was surprised they didn't address the defensive tackle position and even traded away Hassan Ridgeway, but they must really like the guys that they have on board already. And there were so many running backs that would have that I would have anticipated they use at least a late round pick on one, but once again, they must love their guys. They took some players that must have had a special place in their hearts because EJ Speed and a couple of these other guys are players that I'd never heard of. But EJ Speed, like, I couldn't even find a scouting report on him anyway. Overall, this class could be a boom or bust kind of class, but it was really necessary to add a lot of depth to this roster. Plus, the 2020 draft should also impact the overall view of this class too, since they got an extra second round pick in there. But I gotta give this draft a B for now. If you told me the Browns would trade for Odell Beckham and land Greedy Williams and Mac Wilson in the draft, I would have called you delusional at first, and then I would have assumed, all right, well, then they must have traded Miles Garrett or something ridiculous to achieve this. Greedy Williams and Mac Wilson didn't fall because of their abilities. John Dorsey doesn't mind taking chances on guys that might have question marks off the field or in the locker room or whatever, and while that can sometimes pay off, I think you're seeing the downside of this strategy from his previous team right now with the Tyreek Hill situation and Kareem Hunt, who is now 
Cleveland Browns player, but it's a risky move that could pay off or it could really destroy your team. The rest of this draft was actually pretty solid too. I really liked Sheldon Redwine. Uh, linebacker Sion Takitaki's got one of the best names in the class easily. If finally drafted a kicker you need to have a solid kicker and they've been lacking one there for a little while so overall i thought this was a great class and if you factor in the odell beckham trade into this class it's an easy a maybe even an a plus but even without him i think the browns nailed this and got great value that can set them up for a super bowl run in the next few seasons it feels so crazy to say but that is the world we're living in in 2019 the browns have super bowl aspirations right now Let's give them an a guys after losing Max Unger to somewhat unexpected retirement, the Saints had Eric McCoy just fall right into their lap. Then one of the top defensive backs in the class fell due to some alleged attitude issues. Nonetheless, that's two top 50 prospects for a team without a first or third round selection. And they were both positions of relative need, so that's really solid. Alizé Mack could also provide a potential steal as a seventh round pick. He's really athletic and didn't have the most consistent quarterback play at Notre Dame to fully take advantage of it. Now he's going to play with Drew Brees, who's the model of consistency i gotta give the saints even though they didn't have a ton of picks they get a b plus from me Every time I ran through mock draft simulations, I felt like the Chiefs were not in a situation where they were going to have a successful draft. But right before the draft, their position changed drastically. Tyreek Hill might never play another down in the NFL, and with his deep speed being such a crucial part of what makes this offense work, they had to do something here. McCole Hardman was widely known as sort of diet Tyreek or Tyreek Light, whatever you want to call it, so it was a natural fit for them as a replacement. But the trade and new contract for Frank Clark is really what changed things for the Chiefs draft approach. After letting go of D Ford and Justin Houston, and spending a first to pay Frank Clark like a top five pass rusher just feels like they shook things up just for the sake of it. I know they're changing defensive schemes and Ford wasn't going to be an ideal fit against the run in a 4-3 or maybe they still couldn't get over him being offside against the Patriots in the playoffs. It'll probably be a successful addition to the defense but the resources allotted it just seems like an overpay to me and you know another 4-3 team saw D Ford as an option at defensive end so who knows. And I had no secrets during this draft process that Juan Thornhill was one of my favorite players in this draft. And my team with a glaring need at safety passed on him, so I was pretty upset when the Chiefs took him. I was hoping he would fly around and fall to them in the third round, or even they have a chance to trade up for him. But he's really going to open things up for Tyron Matthew to be a chess piece in the secondary, so I really like that move. And then Kalen Saunders is a small school defensive tackle that impressed at the Senior Bowl. He could be a nice nose tackle alongside Chris Jones. But overall, I wasn't thrilled with the Frank Clark trade, mostly just because you're going to have to pay him so much money and you miss out completely on that cheap rookie contract so i'm gonna give this class a b for right now all right and here we are in my dallas cowboys i love my first round pick in amari cooper i didn't at first he grew on me very quickly but similar to the chiefs with frank clark when you trade for a veteran that's near the end of their contract or needs a new contract you really miss out on four to five years of relatively salary cap friendly contracts but you can't argue with the production here to me overall this cowboys draft felt like they looked at their roster and knew that there weren't a lot of players that were going to come in and be instant starters for them in fact Tristan Hill at defensive tackle is one of the only players on here that's going to be asked to start at all what it felt like mostly and the Cowboys aren't lacking potential players for the three technique what it felt like is that they were really looking at the future of this roster I think that Connor McGovern fills in for Lyle Collins next year and they shift last year's second round pick Connor Williams out to right tackle slide Connor McGovern in at left guard the Tony Pollard pick kind of scares me a little bit too because being a Texas guy Travion Williams made a lot more sense there but he doesn't really really have the electric speed and the returnability that Tony Pollard has. I really liked the Michael Jackson pick and then the Joe Jackson pick immediately after that was just really funny for the memes. But Mike Weber in the seventh round seems like kind of a weird pick to me. I don't know why you're going to spend a seventh on a running back when you already drafted another backup running back. Um, I'd rather just collect a bunch of undrafted guys and maybe use that pick on another wide receiver or even a tight end prospect or even double dick the safety because I don't know if Donovan Wilson is going to be the savior there. But Jalen Jux at the very end was great value. But factoring in Amari Cooper, I'm giving them a B minus. If you don't factor in Amari Cooper, then this draft is probably more like a C minus. After looking like the Rams were just going to sort of opt out of this entire draft, they ended up with Taylor Rapp in late in the second round, which I thought was a steal. He could end up being such a good player for them. But the pick that I was the most worried about and sort of alerted by was Daryl Henderson in the third round, who was one of my favorite, if not my favorite, running back in this entire class. But to take him so early for a team like the Rams when you've got Todd Gurley, it makes me feel like, okay, this knee issue is a little bit more serious and we should be officially concerned. Or they just like the idea of having a two-headed monster like they did in the playoffs 
and they just wanted a younger prospect to do it. Still though, feels like a little bit of a reach, but then they kind of made up for it with David Long and Bobby Evans. I felt like were great picks. I don't know how David Edwards made it all the way to the fifth round. And then to get Dakota Allen from Last Chance U to play for a team in LA, just kind of seems like a nice little Hollywood story. So I'm gonna give the Rams a B. With the Bears, if you add Khalil Mack into this trade, it's an obvious win. I mean, you get the, one of the best two players on defense in the league. Makes a lot of sense. David Montgomery was a kind of surprise for me. I didn't think that he was actually as ideal as a fit for this scheme as I initially thought, but after looking into it a little bit more, it does seem like he is a pretty good fit for them. I feel like they lacked the ammunition to trade up and get the guy they really wanted, and they just kind of had to settle for Montgomery. But him and Tariq Cohen should make a good pair. Riley Ridley was a surprising pick too because they seem like they're already set at wide receiver but he looks like a solid prospect so you can't be too upset about that and then they went with another running back just to be safe later on and a couple defensive backs so it looked like they you know corner and running back were their biggest needs and they went and got out a couple guys just to try to solidify that if i was factoring in cleo mack i'm giving this a b plus if i don't factor in cleo mack and i just look at the class they have it looks pretty shady to me i'm going to give them a c that's going to do it for my 2019 NFL draft grades, guys. Maybe during the summer, I will go ahead and look back at some draft grades from a few years ago, and then we can start getting into a yearly tradition of regrading drafts from a couple years behind and just sort of see how they turn out. And then after a couple years, I think I made draft grades for last year, but that was the first year I'd ever done them. So then in a couple years, we can go back and we can start looking at my grades and, you know, really digging in and seeing where I went right and where I went wrong with these way too early assessments. I'm also going to knock out a 2020 mock draft a way too early version i had a lot of fun doing it last year and i think i actually got a couple of players paired up with um the teams that ended up selecting them so that was actually pretty cool i don't know if i've ever done that before so i'm gonna come out with one of those and really those are not even supposed to be taken seriously as i think that this is the order it'll be in it's more about prospect awareness it's about looking up the prospects that are going to be on the radar in going into the season and knowing that this is a an elite player at their position so you know anytime you see the their team on the on tv for a certain game each saturday you can go ahead and, and peep those guys like the the obvious quarterbacks that are going to be in there but there's also a lot of good offensive linemen and it seems like there's some really good wide receivers in the 2020 draft so stay tuned for that i will be trying to put out a video at the beginning of each week each summer long so stay tuned make sure you hit that follow button hit the like button helps me out more than you can imagine i appreciate you guys all for watching liking commenting subscribing all that good stuff and i'll see you in the next video Oh.